It's all about dreams, you know. And by the way, dreams cost nothing; they're free. Uh, the hard part is just keeping them going. And please keep them going because we're here for one simple reason. He believed in the dream. I believed in the dream, and our dreams come true. And there's no reason every one of yours can't either. I used to sit in this little apartment, and it was a room. As a matter of fact, the room was so small. I remember I was able to open up the window and close the door while sitting on the bed at the same time. It was like eight feet by eight feet by nine feet, and but. The one thing about that room, there was really very little distraction. So I would sit there, propped up in bed, and I'd go out with my big pen and and legal pad and just start writing these these stories. And and most of them were 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 very very trivial. But there was something about the process of unrealized dreams. I was always brought back to this subject because I think it's one of the most enduring subjects and one of the most difficult. Passages for people to accept that they never were realized in their own lifetime that they just didn't get that shot. I decided it was a time to come to California. I went to California, and I moved in the valley, and things weren't going very, very well there. As a matter of fact, I had to go out and try to sell my dog because he was either. Uh, do that, or or、uh, he just was not going to be very well fed. And then one night, I went to see、uh, Muhammad Ali fight. For one brief moment, this supposed stumble bump turned out to be magnificent in the fact that he lasted and knocked the champion down. I said, "Boy, this isn't a metaphor for life." His entire life crystallized at that moment. He will be remembered. For all eternity, at least uh, uh, among the fight fans, he did something extraordinary. I said, "Now that—that that is probably what I need as a catalyst for an idea. A man who's going to stand up to life and take one shot and maybe go the distance." So I started to write, and it was one of those writing frenzies. And three days later, I came up with the script of Rocky. Now the script. By no means was a finished piece of material. It was probably about 90 pages, and maybe 10% of it remained in the final script. But it was done. So we're talking a little bit, and I guess I really wasn't right for the acting part. And on the way out, I said, "Oh, I don't know if it matters, but I do a little bit of writing." He goes, "Really?" I said, "Yeah, I'm writing this, this story. This、um, I have this thing about wrestlers, and I might do something about boxing." Well, he says, "Well, bring it around." And I thought. If I hadn't stopped on the way out, you know, that's why I tell all actors, all writers, don't give up. Keep talking. Eventually, you might hit a nerve somewhere, and they go, "Ah, come on back." And if they didn't say, "Come on back," or bring it later, and let's see what you've developed, I wouldn't be sitting here. So I have to give incredible credit to their、uh, to their insight and their patience, and they're willing to take a chance, which、um, it doesn't. Exists much anymore, unfortunately. Originally, when I brought the script to them, they were fairly enthusiastic about it. The one thing they were not enthusiastic about was me playing the part, and, and I really can't blame them at the time. But there was something inside of me that that. You know, this opportunity is never going to come around, and I really wasn't used to money, and I had no idea of what I would be missing. But the temptation started to come forward. First, it was twenty-five grand, then a hundred thousand dollars. I never heard of a hundred thousand because I had like a hundred six dollars in the bank, and like I said, I had to sell my dog, and things were not looking very, very good.、Uh, my forty-dollar car in the spin, and it went up to three hundred thirty thousand. And probably I heard it went up to three hundred sixty thousand. I thought, all right, you know, you really managed poverty very well. You've got this down to a science. You really don't need much to live on. I had, I had like sort of figured it out. So I was not、um, in in any way、uh, used to to the good life. So I thought, you know what? If I, I know in the back of my mind, if I sell the script. And it does very, very well. I'm going to jump off the building, and if I'm not in, so this is one of those things where you just roll the dice and you fly by the proverbial seat of your pants. Say, all right, I got to try it. I got to just 
to it. I may be totally wrong, and I'm going to be taking a lot of people down with me, but I just believe in it. We were working with the handheld camera at the time with, with Garrett Brown, and it was uh, somewhat experimental. And he'd film me running through shopping malls and up down the steps and flights, uh, I mean, curved corridors along the river until finally my legs basically gave out and I'm like writhing on the ground and I want to <laughs> rise up and say, John, I'm dying here. And he goes, no, no, use it. Use the pain. I said, for what? I mean, I'm in misery. He goes, well, no, no. You know, it, it's giving your character, it's, give, it's giving him some depth. I said, it's giving me bruises. It's giving me like agony. I can't sleep at night. I like the scene where we just jumped down and saw this ship along the dock, this uh, uh, docked along the pier. I said, just jump out, run as fast as you can along the ship. And, and, and I'm running and running. I said, you know what? My legs are buckling. I'm, I'm literally going to crash down here. Teeth are going to go, jaw, face. I'm just going to be ground down to this flat-faced image. Please. And I just barely made it. 